Amid the ongoing conflict in the Middle East, there are growing calls within the international community to avert the loss of innocent lives in Gaza amid the looming Israeli ground invasion. Seoul International Aerospace and Defense Exhibition 2023, the country's biggest arms showcase, gets underway this week. We have a preview and up-close look at the country's most up-to-date military assets, from the KF-21 fighter jet to the future of the key defense industry. The nation's tech sector saw its smallest export decline of the year in September, thanks to some improvement in the semiconductor industry. It's October 16, 2023. This is New Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung Min. Amid the ongoing conflict in the Middle East, countries across the world are raising their voices to avert the loss of innocent lives in Gaza amid the looming Israeli ground invasion, including U.S. President Joe Biden. In the meantime, eyes are on the reopening of an Egyptian-controlled crossing amid a humanitarian crisis. Yi Sujin begins our coverage. The international community is mobilizing to minimize civilian casualties from the Israel-Hamas conflict as a ground war seems imminent. Although the Israeli military warned all civilians in the Gaza Strip on Friday local time to evacuate to the south ahead of a possible ground assault, concerns about a humanitarian crisis continue to grow as the Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egypt remains closed. The Rafah border crossing is currently the only potential exit and means to receive supplies of fuel, electricity and water for most Palestinians in Gaza after Israel closed its two border crossings and imposed a complete siege on the territory. The United States has been urging Egypt to reopen the Rafah crossing, and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told reporters in Cairo on Sunday that it soon will be, although he did not specify exactly when. Um, I had very good conversations both um, with the uh, Crown Prince in, in Saudi Arabia and here in Egypt with President al-Sisi and also heard I think a lot of good ideas about some of the things we need to do moving forward including practical ideas on getting assistance to Palestinians in Gaza who are in need. And U.S. President Joe Biden in a 60 Minutes interview with CBS on Sunday local time said that Israel had to respond to the Hamas attack but that it would be a big mistake for Israel to occupy Gaza. He also added that Israel will do everything in its power to avoid the killing of innocent civilians. Western officials have also privately been urging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other senior officials to delay the ground attack to allow civilians to evacuate. They have also called for the nation to provide access to humanitarian aid as concerns about civilian deaths continue to mount according to the Financial Times. Leaders of the Arab League and the African Union released a joint statement in which they urged Israel to reconsider the ground offensive as it could lead to a genocide of unprecedented proportions. The future of the displaced Palestinians remains uncertain even though the Egyptian-controlled Rafah crossing is expected to reopen as Cairo remains opposed to the resettlement in Egypt and because it will be difficult for them to return to their homes in Gaza once they have fled. Isujin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, authorities in Korea have decided to further extend fuel tax cuts until the end of the year in line with efforts to better contain the potential ripple effects of the conflict in the Middle East on global oil prices. Moon Taehyun has details. South Korea will be extending its fuel tax cut until the end of the year amid concerns regarding supply due to the conflict between Israel and the Palestinian militant group Hamas. During an emergency economic meeting on Monday, Finance Minister Chu kyung ho stated that the government will prioritize people's livelihoods as the world grapples with economic uncertainties. We will be making all efforts to stabilize livelihoods and prices by focusing on the management of food and energy prices. The tax cuts, which were lowered to 25% for gasoline and 37% for diesel in January this year, were initially put in place to help curb inflationary pressure amid rising oil prices. This isn't the first time the government has given an extension. It was extended once back in April and then again in August. The most recent extension was set to expire at the end of this month amid a fall in the country's tax revenues, but the conflict between Israel and Hamas prompted Seoul to extend it further. 
Energy and supply chains could be at risk depending on how the conflict develops, and we cannot exclude the possibility of facing difficulties despite global inflation seemingly slowing. Bloomberg Economics also released a report last Friday forecasting an oil price hike of more than 64 US dollars to 150 dollars per barrel should the conflict develop into a war between Israel and Iran. Iran is not only a major source of oil, but it also controls the Strait of Hormuz, through which over a fifth of the world's oil is transported. If Iran blocks this route due to military engagement, a sharp rise in oil prices would be unavoidable. International oil prices surged by around 6% last Friday due to reports that Israeli ground forces were about to be deployed in the Gaza Strip. Chu said that the South Korean government will remain vigilant in order to respond as quickly as possible to any new situations that may arise. Moon hye Arirang News. One of Northeast Asia's largest aerospace and defense exhibitions, dubbed Seoul ADX 2023, kicks off tomorrow. Visitors can get a look at the latest technology that they don't get to see every day, including the homegrown KF-21 for the very first time. What's also worth noticing this time is an unusual landing of U.S. strategic bomber, the B-52. Our defense correspondent, Chae min Jung has a preview. South Korea's first homegrown supersonic fighter jet, the KF-21, soars above Seoul Air Base. It's being revealed to the public for the very first time at the biennial Seoul International Aerospace and Defense Exhibition, taking place from Tuesday to Sunday. This year's exhibition is the largest so far, with some 550 entities from 35 countries taking part. Spectators can get a rare up-close look at the country's latest military equipment, such as the F-35A stealth fighter jets and the F-A-50 light attack aircraft. Also on display is the country's main battle tank, the K-2 Black Panther, which shot to fame when Poland struck a deal to purchase 1,000 of them last year. And to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Seoul-Washington alliance this year, the U.S. has boosted its display of military power. Yes, the B-52 will conduct uh, one to two flybys of Seoul Airfield during Seoul ADEX. U.S. strategic bomber the B-52 is making an appearance as it is making a rare landing at a South Korean airbase this week. Also one of the key U.S. assets on display is the F-22 Raptor, known as the world's most powerful fighter jet. Seoul ADEX has been growing in size with every edition, with Korea looking to become one of the world's top four defense export countries. It's also striving to become one of the world's top air shows. We'll do our best to make Seoul ADEX, which will be held again in 2025, one of the world's top three air shows. Taking this as an opportunity to promote the country's advanced military and space technologies overseas, South Korea has invited senior level military officials and delegations from 53 countries. The exhibition was first launched in 1996 to promote domestic defense firms and boost global technology exchanges. Choi min Arirang News. This year's Seoul Defense Dialogue will be held from tomorrow until Thursday. Ministers from countries including Australia, Malaysia and Mongolia will participate in the event as well as hundreds of officials from 56 different countries. The officials will discuss the escalating North Korean nuclear threat and the changing dynamics of global security. The war in Ukraine as well as the recent Israel-Hamas conflict will likely be discussed at the event. Sources say the dialogue seeks peace on the Korean peninsula as well as promotes security cooperation in the region. The high-level multilateral meeting has been held by South Korea's defense ministry since 2012. South Korea's Foreign Minister Park Jin met with American Special Envoy on North Korean human rights issues Julie Turner today in Seoul. Park said the appointment of the Special Envoy following a six-year vacancy is a significant step as it strengthens the fine foundation upon which Korea and the U.S. can together advance human rights in North Korea. Ambassador Turner, on her very first full day on the job since being sworn in on Friday, said the human rights situation in North Korea remains amongst the worst in the world and that the international community needs to work together to create concrete change. She will stay in Seoul until Wednesday. There are subtle 
yet tangible signs of improvement in Korea's exports of ICT goods amid relative stability in the semiconductor industry. An Song Jin explains. As South Korea's tech exports in September reached 18.1 billion U.S. dollars, according to the Trade Ministry on Monday, the country saw a $7.3 billion trade surplus in ICT trade. Though still showing an on-year decline, tech exports have improved from May, leading to the smallest on-year decline of the year, at 13.4 percent last month. This is mostly due to an improvement in the semiconductor industry, which saw its highest export value this year as inventories cleared out. With semiconductors having a relatively sluggish start to 2023, September's value of exports was the highest of the year so far. Semiconductor exports were still lower than for the same month in the year before, but that on-year decline has decreased to 14.4 percent, with semiconductor exports standing at around 10 billion U.S. dollars, as memory and system semiconductors both improved. However, the weak prices of memory chips is slowing their recovery. Meanwhile, the export of displays was in the black for the second consecutive month as OLED exports increased. China takes up nearly half of South Korea's ICT exports, but exports to China were down 22 percent on-year. Exports to Europe in September decreased by 12.2 percent on-year, while exports to the U.S. also fell by 18.7 percent, even though exports of mobile phones saw an increase. ICT exports to Vietnam, meanwhile, saw an increase of 1.9 percent. Though there are slow signs of recovery in the tech industry, with an overall slowdown in the global economy, exports of mobile phones and computer devices continue to decrease. Han Songjin, Arirang News. Leaders from Asia-Pacific nations gathered this week in Korea to discuss how to envision digital and data cooperation. There, South Korea renewed its support for the establishment of a digital order and shared prosperity that's in tandem with what President Yoon has earlier laid out in New York. Our issue has heard what the participants had to say. South Korea is doing its best to achieve shared prosperity in digital technology with countries around the world. That is according to Science Minister Lee Jong-ho at the Regional Consultation for the Asia-Pacific on the United Nations Global Digital Compact that kicked off in Seoul on Monday. South Korea supports the UN's establishment of principles of digital resources and will actively participate in the making of the order and solidarity of the international community. For two days beginning on Monday, government, business and academic leaders from 11 Asia-Pacific nations are discussing ways to envision digital and data cooperation. Co-hosted by the South Korean government and the UN Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, the meeting provides a chance for the region to exchange their views on realizing a shared vision. So a consultation like the one today that's being hosted by the Republic of Korea is really important for countries to come around a table and really discuss how we can actually work together on leveraging the power of digital technologies for this, achieving the sustainable development goals. The consultation follows Seoul's commitment to establishing a digital order and principles as shared by President Yoon song yeol at the UN General Assembly last year. This year, the South Korean government published what it calls the Digital Bill of Rights. The Digital Bill of Rights presents five principles to achieve an exemplary society that people around the world should pursue. They are freedom, fairness, safety, innovation and solidarity. The Digital Bill of Rights lists specific principles based on six categories. They include ways to safeguard freedom, offer fair access, as well as promote innovation and human well-being. Meanwhile, the results of the consultation will be reflected in the UN Global Digital Compact set to be signed at the Summit of the Future in September 2024. Lee Si-hoo, Arirang News. The 2023 Sustainable Development Transformation Forum commenced in Incheon, South Korea on Monday. Hosted by the United Nations Office for Sustainable Development, around 100 participants from various sectors convened to discuss ways to reinforce the 2030 agenda. The 15-year plan developed by the UN in 2015 is designed to pursue its Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, to tackle major universal issues such as poverty and environmental concerns. Marking the midpoint of the 2030 agenda, this year's forum will center around eradicating poverty.
The UN office established in 2011 is dedicated to implementing the SDGs, particularly for developing countries. With the recent closing of the Hangzhou Asian Games and the upcoming Hangzhou Asian Para Games this week, this Chinese city is more than just sports for Korea. It's where Korean independence fighters found a new beginning after facing tough times in Shanghai. Our culture correspondent Song Yujin went there and files this report. Hangzhou, the host of the largest ever Asian Games, holds a special place in Korea's heart beyond the medals and records. Right next to the famous Xihu, or West Lake in Hangzhou, you'll find the Memorial Hall of the Korean Provisional Government. So originally, there were three Korean Provisional Government buildings here in the city of Hangzhou, but this is the only one that's left. So as you can see, this building, it was originally used by government officials until 1934, but now it's used as an exhibition hall. Open to the public since 2007, the Memorial Hall has two main sections, a recreation of the rooms used by the government and an exhibition hall that tells the story of the Korean Provisional Government's 27-year struggle for independence. The Korean Provisional Government was set up in 1919 in Shanghai after the March 1st independence movement. However, it had to relocate after independence activist Yun bong set off a bomb in Shanghai's Hongkou Park in 1932 that killed several high-ranking Japanese military officials. Fleeing from Japan's invasion of Shanghai, the Korean Provisional Government found refuge at an inn in Hangzhou in 1932. But due to budget constraints, they later moved their headquarters here to Hubian Village a year later. This two-story building served as both a home and a workplace for government officials. Records show that they stayed in Hubian until November 1934 before moving to their third and final headquarters in Hangzhou, Wufuli. The memorial's director says the three and a half years in Hangzhou were a crucial turning point for the Korean provisional government. It was during this period when Kim Gu, one of the founding members of the government, secretly met with then-Chinese leader Jiang Jieshi, where Jiang pledged to fund Korean independence fighters. Kim also established the Korean National Party, which united various scattered groups of independence activists. So, for those who want to step back in time and take a look at this history, the hall is open every day from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., free of charge. Song Yujin, Arirang News, Hangzhou. Time now to have a look at what's been happening in the world of sports. Joining us is our sports editor, Paul Need. Hello, Paul. Hello there. Let's start with golf. Kim Joo Hyung, or Tom Kim Hat, as he's known on the PGA Tour, defended his Las Vegas at Crown. Yes, that's right. He did the Shriners Children's Open. That was done on Sunday local time. He finished at 20 under par, or 264 shots there. One stroke fewer than Adam Hadwin of Canada. That gives Kim three PGA Tour wins and his second Las Vegas title in as many years. It also means that a South Korean has won this tournament for three years in a row, as Im Sung Jae won it in 2021. For Kim Joo Hyung, he is now third when it comes to South Korean wins on the PGA Tour, behind Che Kyung Joo with eight and Kim Shi Yu with four. He's also only the second South Korean golfer to defend a PGA Tour event back to back. Lee Kong Hun is the other who won the AT&T Baron Nelson in 2021 and 2022. Meanwhile, in the women's game, South Korea's Che Hye Jin tied for third at the Buick LPGA Shanghai, narrowly missing out on her first ever LPGA win. Mm. Let's talk about tennis. Um, we had the WTA Korea Open in Seoul over the weekend. Who won? Well, it was actually the uh, US-born half-Korean Jessica Pegula. Uh, she beats uh, Wian Rare of China, 6-2-6-3 in Sunday's final at Olympic Park Tennis Center. It was her second title of the season and fourth overall. Pagula was the top seed heading into the tournament and only dropped one set. 
Impressively, Sunday's victory was Pagula's 53rd of the season, which puts her level with world number one Arena Sabalenka for the second highest number of wins on the WTA Tour this year. Speaking after the match, she said it was really special for her to win in, her, in Korea, her mother's country of birth. And moving on to two of Korea's uh, most popular domestic sports, KBO baseball and K-League football. Both are heading into the postseason. Yes, that's right, they are. Starting with baseball, the KBO. The postseason begins this Thursday. It does so with a clash between fourth versus fifth in what's known as the wild card round. Fourth only needs to tie in the first game to advance, whereas fifth must beat fourth twice in a row. But it's still not decided who those two teams will be, as the regular season only ends on Tuesday, and it's all very, very tight. As for football, the K-League One season will begin final round this Friday with Pohang Steelers hosting Inchung United. The league is now split into two, Final A and Final B. There's the league title up for grabs, also places in the Asian Champions League in Final A. In Final B, though, it's all about surviving relegation with five of the six teams in the bottom half still not safe. And speaking of football, um, the South Korean national team won on Friday. What can you tell us? Yes, 4-0 against Tunisia for what was the team's first home win under Jurgen Klinsmann, their new manager. The goals came from Lee Gang in who scored two in two second-half minutes, including a superb free kick. Then an own goal by Yasin Maria, who got the last touch from a Kim Min Jae header. And Hwang Yee Jo in time added on with a clinical finish. Lee, he was one of three players to start who were part of the Asian Games gold medal winning team, along with Sol Yong Yu at right back and Hong Hyun Sok in midfield. Up next is Vietnam this Tuesday night at Seoul World Cup Stadium. It'll be the team's last friendly before World Cup qualification begins in November. All right, as always, thanks for the wrap up. See you next week. Thank you. See you. and light breeze will lead us to another chilly day tomorrow. With much colder mornings ahead, temperature gaps will widen further. Most regions will be starting off at single figures, while highs will be jumping significantly. Tomorrow's high will be starting off cold at 8 degrees Celsius, which is the coldest morning of the season so far. Highs will be jumping drastically to 20 degrees. For places like Tangsu and Gotang, wider temperature gaps will be seen. Inland regions will see patchy layers of frog for the morning hours. Regions with higher elevations, such as mountainous areas of Kangwonde province, will see frost and even ice at times. For the east coast, high waves are in the forecast, along with gusty offshore winds. For those near the coastlines, please stay away from breakwaters or piers. Sunny skies will dominate tomorrow. Morning temperatures in Seoul will be starting off at 8 degrees Celsius. As for the daily high, Seoul will get up to 20 degrees, Daejeon and Gwangju 21. Busan will be topping out at 23 degrees. Our next chance of rain will arrive this coming Thursday for central regions and Seoul province. That's all for now and here are the weather conditions around the world. That is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session up next. I'm live.
저를 도와주시는 분들이 저희와 함께 해주시는 세션 분들 아무리 봐도 없지 텐션 같은데 아니라고 아무도 안 하는 거고 좋아요 엄청난 에너지를 춤으로 뿜어내는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 한국에 오면 먹어야죠 먹어도 먹어도 끝이 없는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 
everyone. It's Monday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. October 16th is World Food Day and this year comes during a global food crisis with worsening world hunger and malnutrition. Geopolitical conflict, the climate crisis, inequality and economic instability are causing this global food crisis. And many global organizations that are concerned with hunger and food security are trying to tackle this issue, making sure fewer suffer from hunger. One of the leading organizations is the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization and celebrating World Food Day to get to know more about the current difficulties the world is facing regarding food security and to get to know what goals the FAO is trying to achieve, we have invited a very special guest, Mr. Tang Sheng Yao, FAO representative at the Partnership and Liaison Office in the Republic of Korea. Welcome, Mr. Tang. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Now, first question, Mr. Tang. So today, October 16th, is World Food Day, as I have mentioned before. Could you please tell us more about this day? Okay. Thank you very much for the question. Let me first uh, say that I'm very pleased to be here to have such a very important uh, dialogue. To answer your question, I think uh, FAO was established on the 16th October. Mm -hmm in 1944 in Quebec, Canada. Mm. And uh, in 1974, the UN established as a World Food Day uh, on the 16th of October. So ever since then, every year we will celebrate the WFD mm. on the 16th of October, mm. which is the birthday of FL, of course. But what's more important, this celebration is to raise the awareness of people for food security in the world and to reaffirm government's commitments to fight against hunger and poverty. Now, uh, Mr. Tang, I remember the theme for last year was uh, leave no one behind. Mm -hmm. What is the theme for this year and what is so special about this year? Mm, okay, that is a very good question. Uh, every year, as I said, we will celebrate uh, WFD. Mm -hmm. And every year we have a theme which is different uh, from others. Mm. So this is a theme is water. Mm. Water is life, water is food, mm. leaving no one behind. Now water has been very, very important, even more and more important for food and agriculture. Mm. Water is essential to life on earth. Most people think that we have plenty of water Yes, to some extent, mm. but actually only 2.5% of the water is fresh mm. and agriculture accounts for 72% of the global freshwater withdrawal. So like all other natural resources, freshwater is not infinite mm. due to various reasons, freshwater resources per person have been declining by 20% in the past decades. So we need to act now. Mm. We need to work together. What we can do is that stop taking water for granted. Mm -hmm. We need to waste less water. Uh, we need to have more efficient use of water for agriculture and other sectors. We also need to prevent uh, flooding disasters and pollute less water mm. and uh, among other things. Now, this week FAO is organizing the third World Food Forum worldwide, which is a youth-led movement and network to support transforming agri-food systems. My office, the FAO Partnership and Liaison Office in RK, is organizing a WF FF satellite event titled Guardians mm -hmm. of Food Security, which will be also co-organized with the RK National Chapter, which will be on the 18th. And we would like to invite uh, people who would mm -hmm. like to join us. Mm -hmm. We have the online and also the uh, on-site uh, event. You are most welcome to join us if possible. Looking forward to it, Mr. Tang. So the focus for this year is water that is essential for just about producing every food. Um, before we get to uh, specifics, Mr. Tang, I'd like to 
ask you what main role FAO plays. As I said before, there are several organizations worldwide that are working to improve food security and eradicating hunger. What main role does FAO play? Hmm. This is an interesting question. I actually thought about the role of FAO in addressing food insecurity and hunger. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I would think the role, main role of FAO is to lead international efforts to fight against hunger and poverty. Mm. Second, to support and work together with all member countries to address emerging issues and challenges of food and agricultural development. Mm. Third, to provide information and data and expertise on world food and agriculture, including, of course, fisheries mm -hmm. and forestry. When I refer to agriculture, it's a broad sense of agriculture. It includes fisheries and forestry. Fourth, to set food standards as a guidance for member countries. Also, to provide technical assistance to member countries upon request mm. of the member countries. And to partner with UN agencies, other UN agencies, and international organizations for food and agriculture. So in one word, the core mandate and role of FAO is to address food security and nutrition to achieve a world free from hunger. All right, I see. I can see how many roles FAO is taking for the world to be without hunger. Now, uh, Mr. Tang, I'd like to ask you about the FAO partnership and liaison office in the Republic of Korea. And as far as I know, it had an operational launching ceremony in April 2021, which is quite recent. Mm -hmm. What were the expectations when the office was launched? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that question. And the FAO Partnership and Liaison Office in the Republic of Korea opened in 2019. Mm. And then we launched the operation two years ago, three years, two years ago, mm. in April 2021. Mm. Why did we establish the FAO PRO in our case? There are many reasons. I can give you a few. Now, first, FAO has been enjoying excellent partnership and cooperation mm. with ROK mm -hmm. since ROK joined FAO in November 1949. Mm. Second, ROK has been very successful in addressing hunger and poverty since the 1970s. Mm. And up to now, ROK is the first country which has been shifted from an ODA recipient right. to a donor. Right. It's also the first country from a developing country to now a developed country. Mm. So there is much to learn and share for the international community, particularly for the developing countries mm. in many aspects, including food and agriculture, fisheries and forestry, mm. and of course, rural development. Third, the RK government and RK partners are very much willing to share the good experience and practices in food and agriculture development to benefit the developing countries. In terms of ODA assistance and investment, information and technologies, uh, expertise and human resources, so FAO Partnership and Liaison Office is here mm -hmm. to further the excellent partnership and cooperation and build efficient and dynamic communication for all partners. So I'm very pleased to share with you, as I said, uh, next year, we are going to celebrate together with the RK government and partners mm. the 75th anniversary of FAO RK partnership and cooperation. Really? 
All right. Well, it seems ROK had its own unique features to have this FAO partnership and liaison office in the country. Now, we are going to ask you about how you expect this partnership to further be enhanced. But before that, I'd like to ask you about the current news related to food security. Now, Mr. Tang, the food price index most recently released by the FAO was 121.5 points in September, and many media outlets said this was quite stable. Now, first of all, what does this index show? And can you give us some context to this exact figure? Thank you. Um, the FL food price index is a measure of the monthly change mm. of international prices. For a group of commodities, mm -hmm. we have five groups of commodities. It consists of the average of the five commodity groups also weighted by the average export shares of mm -hmm. each of the groups over 2014, 2016. Mm -hmm. So the base period is the years of 2014 to 2016, the three years. Mm -hmm. So when you said 121.5 points mm -hmm. this September, so it means in about seven to nine years, the food prices has increased by 21.5%. Oh. If we compare with the base period, mm. but if you compare with last year price, I mean, last year in March, we had the highest food price mm. of 160. Mm -hmm. If we compare with that, which is a, a substantial drop mm. from the March's all-time high mm. of 160, now, why did it decline? Uh, among, as I said, among the five commodity groups, four commodity groups mm -hmm. fail. I mean, the price. Mm. Only sugar price soared. Mm. Now, comparing with last se September prices, vegetable oil fell by 20.8%. Mm -hmm. Dairy? declined by 23.9%. Meat decreased by 5.1%. Mm -hmm. And cereals was down by 14.6%. Only sugar, as I said, increased by 48.3%. So it's quite understandable that the prices of the majority of the commodity groups declined. Mm and only sugar prices increased. So overall, the FAO food price index declined. Mm. Right, so the overall price of the food have declined, like you said, but uh, only the sugar has hit their highest level in almost 13 years. But what is the reason behind such a surge and what kind of impact does it have? Mm. That is a very tricky question. <laughs> Uh, I can, of course, explain a little bit, uh, but I'm not the expert. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, uh, after this, uh, it can be understood to see why the sugar price has surged so much. Mm. Now, the sugar price averaged 162.7 points last month, up 14.5% points. Now, reaching its highest level since November 2010. Mm. This is mainly because, first, due to the drier than normal weather conditions mm -hmm. associated with a prevailing El Nino event. Mm. Early forecasts indicated that sugar production in key sugar producers, the major producers, Thailand, Thailand and India, mm. the sugar production will decline. So this is the first reason. Now the second reason is that higher international crude oil prices also contributed to the increase mm. in world sugar prices. But that is the scenario we had some you know bad situation. But there is one good thing. The good thing is. Due to favorable, favorable weather conditions, 
Brazil will have a good harvest. Mm. Plus, the Brazilian real, the currency, is weakening against the US dollar. So this has limited the world sugar price rise. I mean, otherwise, sugar price can be even higher. Mm. So if we can imagine the impact of the sugar price increase, the prices of processed food and sweet food containing sugar mm. will certainly or gradually drive up high. All right. Well, Mr. Tom, we have been talking about several reasons behind sugar prices surge. And now that being said, uh, in a much broader sense, I'd like to ask you about some of the elements that affect food security and how the FAO is tackling such issues. Um, on unexpected pandemic, for example, like COVID-19, and of course, geopolitical disputes, conflicts mm -hmm. could be one of the reasons. Uh, how does the FAO deal with kind of issues? Mm. I believe conflicts are one of the most important drivers mm. affecting food security, globally, regionally, regionally, and locally. Usually, poor people and farmers, they suffer most from conflicts and war. Now, the magnitude of conflicts or war varies. Long-lasting conflicts can be very serious to food production and security. Mm. If conflicts involve big producers and exporters, this can be detrimental mm. or very serious to the global markets. It may even lead to food crisis. In order to address the main challenges, FAO joins forces mm. with member countries in many different aspects. Take the Ukraine-Russian conflict as an example. FAO, we convened a special council session in April 2022 for impact of the Ukraine-Russian conflict on global food security. FAO published various information notes and policy briefs on the impact of the conflict and formulated policy proposals mm. for Ukraine. FAO set up monitoring system with Ukraine and conducted needs assessment mm. for the areas affected by the conflict and war. FAO also implements a multi-dimensional and innovative response program to sustain and restore agri-food systems at a scale mm. so that we could help the local farmers and also the local people mm. there to address the food security problem, particularly food shortages. Mm. Thank you. Right. So geopolitical conflicts is one of the major issues that affect food security. But Mr. Tang, the climate crisis is also one of the major reasons. Mm. Uh, according to an intergovernmental panel on climate change report, the agricultural growth rate has decreased over the past 50 years. And, of, and also, if this continues, it, the report said that it is predicted the major cereal prices could increase by up to 23 percent by by around 2050. How serious is this? Mm. Well, uh, FAO has also a report mm. which is called uh, SOFI, mm -hmm. the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, mm. which is an annual report. According to SOFI 2023, 735 million people suffered from hunger mm. last year which was an increase of 122 million from 2019. 2.4 billion people faced food security problems, moderately or severely. 148 million children under the age of five years were stoned. Mm. 3.1 billion people, which is about 42% of the world population, can't afford a healthy diet. Mm. Now, you know, many factors are driving forces for food prices. 
which drives the food prices up and down. Mm. Global, global population growth, economic development, and urbanization have led to increased demand for food mm. and quantity food. People's shift in, in dietary pre preferences may also affect food prices. So, to avoid food price fluctuations, I mean substantial, very big fluctuations, and the increased agricultural growth rate, among other things, it's most important to increase investment mm. in food and agriculture. Mm. Of course, including ODA mm. assistance mm. in food and agriculture. And over the past decades, we've been seeing decline in ODA assistance in food and agriculture. Mm. To revert this, we need to do more. I think investment is a paramount important thing for mm. us to do. And for that, uh, did FAO come up with any uh, particular measures? Yes, we do have, and we'll come back uh, maybe later and uh, when we talk about some other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, FAO is doing a kind of uh, uh, initiatives and try to bring developing countries and developed countries together mm -hmm. to join a big gathering, a forum, so that uh, they could find opportunities for investment. Mm. And we had one last year and we're going to have another one, for example, that hand-in-hand -hand initiative forum, uh, which is going to, to be held uh, very soon, uh, next week. Mm -hmm. All right, looking forward to it. Well, Mr. Tong, I believe this will be our last question. Um, how have the FAO and the Republic of Korea's cooperation regarding this food security sector has been up until now? And how do you expect this uh, cooperation partnership to be in the future? Mm. Well, as I said, uh, FAO has enjoyed excellent partnership since no November 1949. Mm. After 75 years, ROK has developed and changed greatly. Mm. ROK is now a G20 economy and a very important member of FAO. ROK is very supportive to FAO's policy and the strategic objectives. You know, RK now is a ninth contributor mm. to FAO really? for the scale of contribution. 2.574% of the FAO regular budget is from RK. Mm. At the same time, RK is also one of the top 10 voluntary contributors to FAO's programs and projects. We have, ROK has supported a lot to the FAO programs mm -hmm. such as Codex Alimentarius, IPPC, mm -hmm. International Plant Pro Protection Convention, and International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism, rice value chain, African swine fever, maybe you know. Those are some, only some of the financial programs and projects supported by ROK, mm. to name a few. On the other hand, FAO has served as a strong partner for ROK in disseminating ROK's rich know-how, information, and technologies, including the good experience and practices. RK sent eight secondees to FAO to support formulation of guidelines for member states to address the emerging challenges for food and agriculture. For the future, we can do more mm, yes. and better. We need to continue to share good experience and practices of food and agriculture from our key. We will certainly share the good stories of Samu Undong. Mm -hmm. Hope I pronounced correctly. <laughs> Smart farming, digital 
digitalization of food and agriculture, mm. climate change response, agricultural adaptation and mitigation programs, sustainable fisheries and agriculture, afforestation, and recently, very good control of the forest fire. Mm. So forest fire control. You may know that uh, RK government is committed to double ODA right. in the next five years. Mm. So this will give us a great opportunity to explore and expand our excellent partnership and cooperation. I believe RK was a good example in addressing hunger and poverty and can be a another good example in the future in sharing its good practice and experience to benefit developing countries to achieve no poverty and zero hunger, a world free from hunger. Mm. Uh, finally, uh, as you said, this is the last question, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd like to take this opportunity, if you allow me, to express uh, my sincere appreciation to the RK government mm. and all the RK partners for their very strong support to FAO and the FAO Partnership and Liaison Office in the Republic of Korea, which is currently my office. As I told you, we are located in so global center, mm -hmm. Zhong Ro, yes, which district. is the center of the center, yes. <laughs> which is very convenient. Mm -hmm. You can visit us by any transportation means, bus, underground, taxi, or whatsoever. So uh, anyone who would like to visit my office, she or he is most welcome. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the time you have spent for this uh, very interesting dialogue. All right, Mr. Tang, I hope both FAO and Republic of Korea could continue to see this strong partnership. Now, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. Uh, Mr. Tang, thank you for your time and insights. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. Kim Bo Gyung Nim. Mm -hmm. uh, I really hope that uh, uh, we will have a another time yes. to uh, elaborate uh, about this excellent uh, partnership and uh, cooperation. I, will visit I really enjoyed the dialogue this afternoon and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, this is all for Within the t Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.